92.1 WROI, WROIFM.com. We are streaming audio live on RTC Channel 5. Audio and soon to be video on RTC Channel 4. That's why Scott has stayed in the studio this morning. Hey, Scott. Hey, good morning. Where's my coffee cup? Uh, you don't have one? Awesome. It's been a while since I've been okay, here. Okay, okay. We'll we'll get you a new one and put your name on it, okay? So that way you can be, you know, you, we don't have a coffee, but we've got the cups. Okay, okay. okay. Just, just so you know. Darn <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> John Alley with us, President and CEO of Woodlawn Hospital for our monthly report. John, good morning. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Hey, today. it's always a pleasure to be here. All right, what's happening at Woodlawn Hospital uh, outside of uh, everything? We had a fairly... Uh, productive meeting yesterday. Very good. Uh, not many s subjects were covered, but uh, some very important stuff. One of the things that we discussed with the board is there's a, uh, we've noticed a decrease in our inpatient population, which has to do with technology. Sure. Uh, patients just aren't coming into the hospital anymore. So we're, in the past, we've never, it's called a swing bed. So if you're discharged from the hospital but still need some rehab, you know, in the past, we've kind of said, okay, you need to go to a nursing home for, you know, two, three weeks, something like that. The hospital has a provision in it where we could call it a swing bed, so you don't have to leave the hospital. So we've never really promoted that. We kind of got looking. We I think we have the capacity now with some uh, rooms that we could assign that make them swing beds. So, so those folks that come in maybe for a, an orthopedic procedure, sure, you know they're in the hospital quote for three or four days, and then we discharge them to a, a rehab facility. Now they can stay there. We can do that rehab in the hospital. You don't need to go somewhere else. So working with a group of folks, kind of get that program dusted off. And hopefully have it going, you know, it's, it's kind of going now, but we really want to have that refined uh, within the next week or so. So those patients that do qualify to be a, what we call a swing bed patient, you don't need to leave the hospital. You can stay there, you get your rehab there, and it's, instead of going to a nursing home where you're not familiar, right. you can stay right there in the hospital and sometimes stay in the same room. You don't need to switch rooms. So we just think that's going to be a benefit to the patients, a little more continuity of care, Make them a little more comfortable, and the goal is, you know, get them up, get them out of the hospital, and get them home as soon as we can. Now you did mention they have to qualify for that. There, there are certain qualifications. Okay. They have to be in a, a, a rehab program where they, we can demonstrate improvement from day to day. Um, so it's, it's there, you know, not everybody's going to qualify. Some folks, you know, they have whatever their condition might be. They just can't do rehab. So you have to be able to do the rehab so we can show that there is improvement there. The max you can stay at the hospital is a hundred days. Uh, and that's by uh, Medicare regulations. Okay. After that, then you would have to go to a long term care facility. But most of what we're seeing is folks, maybe 10, 12, 15 days post-surgery, just get them back on their feet, get them back going so that they can get home and carry on their normal daily okay. activities. So that's going to be kicking off real soon. We did have BSA come back in. They were here last month as we were talking about our room renovations. And, uh, you know, the, the more we get into it, the deeper the water seems to get. You know, <laughs> what do we really want to do? So yesterday, we kind of discussed, do we want to make the rooms bigger? And the only way to do that is we have to cut down on our number of rooms. So we looked at a plan where they would take three current rooms and make them two, much larger. Right now, the room's about 165 square feet. The new rooms will be about 240 square feet. Which, still with two beds? No, single. Still okay, private okay. rooms. It's private rooms. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Keep them private rooms. Okay. So that would, right now, we have 21 patient rooms that we can put patients in. If we would go with this where we do the three for two, that would take us down to only 15 rooms. So... You know, that, that's getting kind of, how close is that to our average? Because we don't want folks acutely need to come in and say, oh, we don't have any rooms left. So we're working with the medical staff. We're going back and, and kind of do a study. What is our average daily census? Or over time, how many patients have we had in the hospital? And preliminary, we're looking usually 12 to 13. So that 15 would work quite well into that. Um, you know, there's just a lot of things you got to look at as far as, you know, peak seasons, flu season. You know, there's been some days where we've had 17, 18, 19 patients. What do you do on those days? So it's, it's not etched in stone yet, but really like the design that Arctic came up with to make that room a little bigger. Um, right now, you know, you have so much equipment. If you're in the hospital now, you're really sick. And the rooms, when they were designed, you know, several years ago, didn't have all that much equipment in there. Well, now, once you get everything in there, there's hardly room for visitors and, and staff. So, really, I like the idea of expanding rooms, but a little apprehensive on, you know, cutting down basically seven, eight rooms out of our total uh, rooms that are available. The other question, how does that affect staffing? Wouldn't change staffing at all, because right now we staff for 12 patients. So, if we have 
you know 15 rooms and we're you know we could still staff it so it wouldn't have any effect you know on any reduction in workforce so you know staff doesn't have to worry about oh am i going to lose my job if we take out seven rooms it's we're already kind of at that level now so it's kind of interesting uh you know there's a lot of things that come into play as as we try to what do we do today to meet our needs 10 and 12 years from now? And, you know, I tried dusting off the crystal ball, and it, it just didn't really work that well. It, uh, at least you haven't broken it yet. Haven't I, well, I was ready to throw it a little bit, I think. Uh, you know, there's just, for every answer, we would come up with two more questions come up. How, what about this and how we do that? So we're really taking the boards an active role in this. Uh, we're thinking about it. Met with all the leadership of the hospital today and said, guys, I need your input. And we'd like to have an answer sometime by the October or so. You know, where do we go? Do we keep our current rooms and just update them, uh, refresh them, or do we do a major overhaul, reduce the number of rooms, and make them bigger? And what we're up against right now, any new hospitals being built, those rooms are 240 to 250 okay. square feet. Um, and that was the architect saying, you know, you're kind of behind the eight ball. When you built this hospital, you know, was it 1979? It was state of the art, you know, all private. But now we're, we're seeing that, that the, the rooms need to be a little bigger. So do we make that? Uh, switch and say, okay, let's take some rooms out of service, but make them bigger, much more convenient for patients and family. So it, does it have to be an either or? Uh, can it be like, uh, okay, instead of seven rooms, we're going to take out four or something like that? that that's the second part okay. now we're looking at. Can okay. we say, okay, let's take this wing here right. that, that is, you know, six rooms and make them three? Or can we take these six rooms and make them four and increase those? And still keep, you know, uh, more than that 15 beds. So that's all the options that we're kind of going through right now. Uh, from a cost basis, you know, by mix and matching, it doesn't make that much difference in cost. And, you know, my concern was, well, if I start taking out a lot of walls and putting new walls in, that's going to drive the cost up. And when we look at the, the difference between just remodeling what we got and, re, you know, reducing number of rooms, it was only about $160,000 difference. So, you know, it sounds like a lot of money, but in a $3 million project, it's not that big of, of, of a deal. So the cost of, you know, reducing number of rooms is not an issue. It's logistically, will that work as we look to the future? Um, you know, one of the things that we saw that's coming up, there was a pilot program in uh, New York City where the physicians admitted you to home not to the hospital. And there was five different diagnoses that they could do that. So you, the hospital would ship a hospital bed to your house, IV pumps to your house, nurses would come to your home. And insurance companies said that's a much lower cost model for them. And they saw equal results as being home or in the hospital. So if that's going to be within the next five to 10 years, we're going to see more folks not in the hospital actually go be in the, the home then the 15 beds makes a little more sense. So, again, trying to, to look in that crystal ball and where's all this going, is uh, you know, keeps you up at night trying to figure out what is the best thing to do that meets current needs, but also go meet our future needs as we look, you know, 10 years down the road. Because, you know, in 10 years, if all we have is seven, eight, nine inpatients, then why have this excess capacity that, you know, basically we can't use? So uh, it's going to be a tough decision for the board. It's going to be a tough decision for the administrative folks at the hospital. What do we do? And so, you know, again, fairly major endeavor we're going to do. If we're going to do it, do it right, get it right the first time. So in five years from now, we're not saying, oh, gosh, exactly. should we have done this? And then all of a sudden have to redo something because it always costs more money to fix something you've done than to do it right the first time. So hopefully uh, all of us can get together and, we can figure out where we want to go with this and, and what is the blend that we want to have for our hospital as we look to the future. So after we got kind of th through all that, everybody was wore out because it was, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, it was a lot, of, a lot of thinking. We had a lot of good questions for the architects and the engineers. How does this fit into our current scheme? And, you know, from uh, logistics, how do you get the, you know, the, the steam and heat from current building to this new rooms? So all that was worked out yesterday. So we feel fairly comfortable now that we've got the logistics down how to do it. It's just now what do we want to do? And uh, right now, I'd like to have, you know, some sort of construction started late 2019. I think that is a fairly reasonable time frame. By the time we get the design done, put it out for bids, get, you know, the architects come in, get the contractors in. And this could be at least a 24 to 30 month project because I can't take all the rooms out of service. So we just do, you know, three to four rooms at a time, renovate those, move on to the next block of rooms as we move through that second floor. Dealing with hospitals, does it take a specialty contractor? 
they have to have some health care experience. There's, uh, you know, fairly strict infection control standards. So anytime we, we basically anymore, if we get into the ceiling, we have to create a negative airspace within that work. So we've got a special little uh, tunnel we put in that's got filters on it. So any air that escape has gone, it goes through a HEPA filter. So we're not getting any dust and dirt. So it does take some special equipment, special knowledge on in working in healthcare, and especially if you're demoing walls, then we have to seal off that area completely put HEPA filters in there, turn off the air handling to that area. So if there's any drywall dust or stuff, it doesn't get, you know, into the air, then it could filter into the patient room. So it does take somebody who's got experience in that. It does cost a little more to do healthcare renovation because of these infection control procedures you have to do. There's more material involved, higher costs. So uh, we, we realize that going in and that's why we got to stage this. Okay. What block of rooms is it? We can easily block off basically seal in a, in a plastic bubble so that nothing can come out of that room. The workers are required. We'll have like a, a three-stage entry system. Uh, first stage, they'll go in, and then, you know, next one and the next one, all air locks. And as they come out, there's we call sticky mats. So if they walk out, anything on their shoes is pulled off, stuck to those mats that we change two or three times a day. So it's it's a fairly big deal once you get into it. And, you know, folks come in and never seen it before go, my gosh, what's going on? Well, it's, you know, that's what required. Make sure we keep everybody else safe when we're doing any renovations in the hospital. Well, it's pretty obvious you can't do it all at once. Cannot do it all at once. I mean, we would have to shut the hospital down and, and we just can't do that. So, again, how do we stage that so we get the maximum benefit when we block these rooms off and uh, you know that's where the architects come in because we have to shut off the air handling that so where are some control valves where we can shut stuff down uh plumbing same thing we got to replumb all this area so you know it's going to take a while i think to get all that down and say okay we turn this valve that shuts that section off and how do we do that once that's done then we'll start with the process of uh, either renovating or taking walls out and putting new walls in so okay. it, it's kind of i'm excited about it but i'm also apprehensive <laughs> about it at the same time once we got done kind of with that everybody took a little bit deep breath and we kind of got in what was the financials for the month of june uh, we had gross revenue about 11.3 million uh, wrote off our 7.2 million so we're sticking in that 60 percent range had operating expenses of 4.3 million has some non-operating revenue which is uh, dollars that come into the facility not directly related to patient care, about 200000 So we had a net income for the month, about $70,000, which is good. Usually during these summer months, we really are used to seeing red numbers and not black numbers. So it was kind of nice to see a black number. You know, looking at July, it was really slow the first three weeks. And now all of a sudden, uh, we really picked up this week. So hopefully that trend will continue to okay. help us build that bottom line because by building the bottom lines, how we can do the renovations and the improvements to meet the needs of the community. John Alley, President and CEO, Woodland Hospital. Did that pretty well cover the meeting? That was John? pretty well the meeting. Like I say, the the, the architects. Uh, I think it, they went 40, 45 minutes, almost Probably. an hour, because it was and it was a good discussion. We need to have that because you know this is a very major endeavor, and let's get it right. Don't want to just rush into it and then all of a sudden halfway through, oh, we forgot this. So uh, we're we're taking our time. We're going to do it right. Get the most benefit out of the dollars we're going to spend. John, I'm curious, uh, Fulton County talking about uh, the potential down the line to build a new jail, opioid addiction, that increases the jail population. Does Woodlawn Hospital see some of those folks before they end up at Fulton County Jail? Yeah, I mean, it's, it depends on uh, how bad they are, when they, but most of them have to be medically cleared before they can go to the jail. And, that, you know, that's a good thing. It, it protects the jail because if, if they just took somebody in there and all of a sudden, you know, they're having an overdose or whatever, you know, then they, they don't have the capability on site to handle that. So it's a good thing they bring them out, have a physician look at them, medically clear them. If they have, say, I've ingested, uh, you know, uh, heroin or whatever, let's make sure you're okay to put into jail before we do that. You know, it's for the you know, for their safety. It is an addiction. Uh, it's a sickness, basically. Right. And, uh, you know, you, you got to treat them as human beings. And let's, what can we do to help them? So we medically clear those. Uh, you know, we still get the folks that, that overdose. In the field, they'll give them the Narcan, and they'll kind of get them, you know, responsive. They still, let's bring them to the hospital. Let's get you checked out to make sure you're okay. So we do see those folks. Um, they come to us first, then go to the jail. So, you know, we're, we kind of work very closely with the sheriff's department and the state police and the Rochester City Police. You know, good working relationship with them as they bring folks in. We try to get them in and out as quick as we can. We know they're busy, and we don't want them 
stuck there waiting on us to treat those folks and get them cleared. So we try to get them in very quickly so that they can get get them to the jail and get back on the streets where they need to be. Do they spend the night? Some of them do. Okay. If they're not medically stable, uh, then we will keep those folks. Uh, usually on an OD, sometimes they'll go up to the ICU. We'll have to keep them up there. So, yes, they do get to spend the night with us sometimes. A lot of others are in and out in an hour, two hours, however long it takes to stabilize them before we can go ahead and release them to, the, to go to jail. John, another question I, I had uh, last uh, fall, I think it was, when the uh, Gulf tornadoes came through and uh, Puerto Rico got particularly hit bad. And a lot of the drugs that mm-hmm. come to your facility were what, shipped out from Puerto Rico. Has that situation Th- that's resolved That's kind of itself? stabilized. We're, we're not on that drug shortage as bad as it was. Okay. We still have a few drugs that are on shortage, but it was more than just drugs. It was IV solutions because a lot of the materials, that you know, the bags that they put the IV solutions in, located in puerto rico the manufacturing for the iv drugs puerto rico so it was you know real touch and go for quite a while as we were waiting for those plants to come back up on operation Probably challenging for the doctors it was challenging for everybody because all of a sudden now i've always used you know xyz i can't do that anymore what's my alternative uh fda did approve there were some iv solutions that came in from europe that uh in before had never been able to come in because it you know, they just didn't meet the standards. They kind of re- reduced their standards because it was a critical situation. So I, we're back pretty close now. I, we've got a, a small list of drugs that we can't get, but IVs seem to be, you know, back full production right now. We're not seeing that, uh, you know, massive. You know, we were searching everywhere. And unfortunately, some folks made a lot of money off that because they kind of saw some of this coming, so they hoarded it. And what we were paying maybe $100 a case for, all of a sudden we're paying eight, nine $900 a case because you have to have it. And, uh, you know, it's unfortunate people want to take advantage of, of that situation. That's, you know, part of doing business. But fortunately, right now, we're in good shape. Uh, I think the drug manufacturers learned a lesson from that. So I think they've diversified a Diversify, little bit. Sure. Not all their eggs are sure. in one basket sure. now. So they're doing some off uh, offshore storage. Not only in Puerto Rico, there's some in the States now. So if something like that would happen again... They do have a little bit of a backup supply they can go to until they get back up in production. Again, John Alley, President and CEO of Woodlawn Hospital. John, as we wrap this up today, good people at Woodlawn Hospital. Absolutely. I, you know, I, I say it uh, many times. Everybody out there makes me look real good to make my job <laughs> really easy. Uh, you know, they're just quality folks out there, and it's just a pleasure to work with them. And I, I get asked, well, when are you going to retire? And I said, when I stop having fun. Uh, I still enjoy going to work sure. every day. I love working with the folks out there. And, ju- and it's just fun. It's a fun place to be. Um, very stressful. You know, the staff works hard. Uh, the people they deal with, you know, are either sick or their family member is sick. So and you're not happy if you're sick. And you're not happy if you're sick. And, and we've kind of found that if we can just lighten that stress a little bit, you heal quicker. You know, if you're in a happy sure. environment, you're going to get in and get out a little faster. And uh, that's our goal. Try to, to do the best we can. Do we please everybody 100% of the time? No. But we do our best, and, uh, you know, it's, for each one complaint that I get, I'll get 20 notes saying, hey, I, I th- you know, thank you for this staff member or this department. I love the way they treated my family, or I was in the emergency room, and the doctor treated, you know. We get a lot of those, and we share those with the staff. So, you know, contrary, the staff likes to get those. So, folks, <laughs> if you had a good experience, let them know, because most of the time, all we hear is the bad experiences, because everybody, you know, if they have a good experience, oh, everybody knows that, I don't need to send anything. But it really makes their day because we share all those that come through administration to the department or to that individual. If they're mentioned, we give that to them so that they know that it was recognized what they did. John, I, uh, as we again, as we wrap this up this morning, I just uh, one thing I hope is that uh, by the time we have our visit next month, your crystal ball is dusted off. I, I, I've been polishing it. Okay. Uh, we're, we're hoping that uh, by then we can have a much clearer vision of where we want to be. You know, what's, what's health care going to look like in 10 years? And, uh, you know, I think if I could answer that question, I could retire a billionaire. <laughs> uh, but we're going to do the best we can. Great minds are working on as far as the board and all my leadership team. We'll come up with that answer where we want to be and have that ready to go. Catching any fish in the pond? Folks are fishing out there. Yeah. And I, I don't know if they're catching any, but uh, <laughs> it appears they're drowning a lot of worms. <laughs> John, as always, thanks very much. We appreciate your time. Thank you. 92.1.